Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 14 reads, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, Let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint you over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the Levitical priest. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of his law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over the kingdom in Israel. And in 1 Timothy 6, Paul writes to a young pastor, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, as we, uh, as we begin a series and look at really the nature of what you, you have uh, decreed for human government, and you give us insight into how it operates and, and uh, what are the potentials within it for good and for bad. Father, I pray that we would have hearts that are wise, that are seasoned by your word, and that are guided by your spirit. Lord, I ask today that we would teach well your word and that it would impact our lives um, even this very hour. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Did you ever see in the movies a scene where uh, a, a bomb is about to go off and, uh, and, and some, for some reason, you know, the, the person who finds it is always the main actor or main actress in the film, despite the fact that they have no real skill or ability or training in how to defuse a bomb? You can pick any one of literally hundreds of those types of scenes. They're, they're in lots and lots of movies where they, they come across this bomb and there's not enough time for them to go get somebody with actual training. There's not enough time to get everybody out of the building and just run away from the bomb. And so they're left with this similar scene that you've seen over and over again where they've got to cut the wire. And they don't know if it's the red wire, the blue wire, the green or the yellow, but there's a wire and they've got to cut the wire. And if they cut the wire then they're going to live or they're going to die, right? And, and inevitably, because it's the movies, they always cut the right wire. Uh, but, but the reality is to do a sermon that looks at the nature of political systems during our season right now feels a lot like I've got a bomb in front of me and I don't have a lot of training, but I've got to cut a wire. <laughs> it, it feels like I could at any moment say something that would maybe not sit well with you or maybe challenge you in an area that, that you might not want. And, and so essentially... I feel literally to talk about this subject right now in, in our circumstances that we're in as a country um, that, that I could cut the wrong wire. And so this is, this is my request for you before we even really get started. My request is, first of all, that you would grant me permission to be able to go into God's word and really just the fact that you're here, I mean, you're giving me permission, but, but um, a willingness in your heart to be able to go where might be sensitive because we are so guarded about this issue because of how volatile it has become. So I ask for your permission. I also ask for grace because my goal is not to speak to everything. I'm going to be very sp specific to say what I say and not say what I don't say. If you want to know kind of what I think about something, I'd be happy to give you an answer off the stage because this is this is not about that when i was hired here i made a promise that i intend to keep until either god takes me home or moves me elsewhere that this is about god's word i'm not up here for my personal opinion i don't in any way consider my personal opinion to be anywhere worth the value of being able to say that it deserves time on sunday morning it's just not there it's not to say that politics aren't important 
It's not to say that God doesn't call certain people to those positions, and it's not to say that we shouldn't have uh, uh, civil responsibilities as followers of Jesus Christ. I I think we should. It's just to say that what God has called me to in this particular role, on this particular platform, is to be obsessed with something that is of far more importance than my opinions, and that's the Word of God. So we're going to go there because the Word of God goes there. The Word of God draws attention to this issue again and again, but it does it probably for far different reasons than the average news article, Facebook post, or, or uh, whatever it is that you could get news from. The Word of God does it, and we're going to look at this in a way that I think is going to challenge us to, to really take a look within ourselves. You know, you know what I want you to be this, this, this next four weeks is, as I'm going to preach uh, two sermons and then Eric's got one and we're, we're really excited about how this is going to unfold but these next four weeks I want you to be a bridge inspector I want you to be a bridge inspector now think about it like this how many bridges did you drive over on the way to get here this morning and not have a thought in your mind about whether or not they were going to hold you if any of you by the way have a fear of bridges I apologize for the next minute okay but how many bridges did you come over this morning without thinking about, huh, I should check, I should get out, and I should look and see, you know, does, does this bridge look like it's going to hold my car? Does it look like it's going to hold us and to be able to, to go over it safely? And I was thinking about that this week because somebody actually sent me um, kind of a drone aerial view, view of a bridge that fell apart, and it's the Kinzu Bridge. And we actually have a photo of the bridge that is falling apart, which is just insanely cool to look at, first of all. But if you look at it, it's like that used to be a bridge that I believe allowed trains to go across or or people to walk across or whatever. And now it's not anymore. And I asked a friend of mine, I have a friend who is a bridge inspector. I said, hey, Josh, you know, what happened with that Kinzu Bridge that caused it to fail? And he he said, "Uh, well, let me look it up. He looked it up and he got back to me. He said, "Um, that bridge actually fell from a tornado and the whole thing collapsed in 30 seconds which had to be incredible to see. The whole thing collapsed in 30 seconds. I said, well, what made it collapse? And he said, well, the tornado did, but at the, at the bottom of the foundation, there are anchor bolts, and the anchor bolts were corroded, and they couldn't withstand the force of the wind, force of the torque on the structure. And so in 30 seconds, because of the bolts, the whole thing fell out from underneath it. He, he said, uh, it's a crazy thing to think about something so small having such significance as a bolt that can cause the whole thing to fall. I mean, this is, his, this is part of his job, to design and inspect bridges. And I said, what, like, when you, when you do a bridge inspection, what do you look for? And he said, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, like, what do the beams look like? Are there crackings that I can see in different places? Are there holes in the deck? Are, are, are there, is there wear underneath at the foundation? He's, he's laying out different things that he's going to look for that are weaknesses. And the reality is he looks at those bridges far differently than what you or I ever really will. We'll just kind of drive over them the rest of our life. Even knowing all this, you're not going to stop at every bridge that you come to and go out and look at it because we have bridge inspectors to do that. I'm asking you, politically speaking, and as we look at the Word of God, to, to be a bridge inspector. To look and say, what does God teach us here? Look, look, not so much the specific particular issues, but to stand back and look at the system as a whole and say, what does God want us to know in, in this area? And specifically, what is it that He says lies beneath it all? What are its fail points? And what does it teach us about us and what we really want? What does it teach us about our soul? That, that's the goal. And that's why we start with, before we even look into the book of Kings, which we're going to look at in a couple of weeks, um, we look at really the preface to all of it. And you, you look in the scriptures in Deuteronomy, God's giving the law. This is centuries before they ever have a king. This is hundreds of years before there's ever somebody in that position. And God goes, I want you to know something. Write this down, put it in the law, because there's going to come a time when you're in the promised land and you're following after me or attempting to follow after me, but you're going to get frustrated with the idea that I am your king. You're going to want to be just like all the other nations and you're going to demand that you have a king, a human king to rule over you and I want you to know some things. I want you to know what's going to happen. This is God saying you get to be the bridge inspector in this. You get to know the typical fail points 
of where this is going to break down. The second that we put a human king corrupted by sin, just like every other person in this world, in that particular position, there are certain things that are going to fall out. Certain things that are going to be fail points. And he goes down and he runs through a, a, a list of them. He says a king is, is prone to make foolish and selfish choices based on a few things. Number one, he's just going to want to be popular. He's going to want people to like him, and that's going to be a temptation over and above doing the right thing for, for the society as a whole, that he's just going to want people to think he's a good guy and a good leader. And he, he goes on to talk about this. He says he's going to want horses. And what stood out to me as, and, and would stand out to you if you read Deuteronomy again is it says he wants to get horses not for his army for the good of his people, but it says he wants horses for himself to increase his own power. It says that he'll be tempted to have many wives for his own pleasure. It, it goes on to say that he will want silver and gold. Why? For his prosperity. And that if he's not careful, he will think of himself to be better than the other people because of his pride. And we see five typical fail points for the system from God's perspective. Where God's going, look, this is not the ideal situation for a human being to rule over human beings because there will be temptations that are absolutely entirely unique to this. This is the kid in the proverbial candy store. You put their heart in this situation without the accountability and with all the opportunity, and man, this is, has the potential again and again to turn out wrongly. If you don't think so, look at all the leaders that are in the past that are notoriously evil and consider those five things. Popularity, pride, pleasure, power, prosperity. How many of them at the end of the day are chasing after one or more of those things? And I would say to, to, a, to an exact degree that if you took every leader who would, we would consider evil and we would consider wicked and you looked for one of those five things to be the source of what was going wrong, I'd say it'd be there. And it's fascinating to think about that centuries before they even had a king in the position, God said, this is what you're going to experience. Yeah, I, I think about it like this. When, uh, when my wife and I bought our first home in 2009, we, uh, we bought a little, little tiny single-story ranch house, no basement, 960 square feet. We knew we were either going to learn to love each other or learn to hate each other in a hurry. What amazed me was the people that lived there before us in 960 square feet, which is a little bit bigger than the stage platform that we've got here, they had five kids, two dogs, and three cats. And I'm like, I don't, th this was basically a zoo cage at that point. I mean, this is insane. But, but we thought, we're, we're, you know, the price is right. We love the location. It's right across the street from some people that we liked. And we thought, this is, this is going to be a great first house. And we did the home inspection. And we, we did uh, the sellers, they did the seller's disclosure. And one of the things that came out was that house had radon issues. And we looked and we talked with the home inspector. And he said, well, they have a fan here and, and the fan is to, to remove it. And, and he said, but you know, this, this is, it is what it is. You've bought a house, you're, you're buying a house that has issues with radon coming from underneath it. And, and that's, that's what it is. There's the fan there. And, and it's a little bit unsettling, to be honest. And I know, I know there was a system to remove it, but it's a little bit unsettling to know that there's something that goes with that home. Because there's not a part of me that could have shown up to the, the, uh, you know, the official final you know, purchasing thing where you sign your life away without actually reading you know, 700 pages of documents and said, you know what, on second thought, we'd like to buy the house, but we want you to keep the radon. They would have been like, what are you talking about? You, you can't do that. No, no, no. I'd like to buy the house, but I want you to keep the radon. So if we could just adjust the price that you keep the radon and we get the house. No, because that goes with the house. It goes with the territory that's there. That's what God is saying in Deuteronomy 17. You're going to want a king to be just like everybody else. You're going to want a king, but I need you to know that when you buy a king, you get the radon. When you put a human in a position where they have unrivaled, uh, unrivaled opportunity to do what they want, there's a chance that the same selfishness that exists within each one of us will become amplified. 
And they will seek to do things for their own betterment, not for the nation or for the people. I can't wait to show you this in the, in the coming week as we, we look at the, the kings of Israel where it's just so blatantly obvious that they're guarding these areas of life. And, and so here's, the, so where do we go with that? Does that mean that we should overthrow the idea of having a ruler in a country? No, by no means. What it means is we understand the system. So we step back. We're bridge inspectors and we say, okay, that's where it's likely to fail. And so number one, we, we look at what God's word calls us to do, which is so incredibly important, but we don't look at it as as important as it is, but to pray for our leaders, regardless of whether or not we like them. Because when Paul argues that we should pray for our leaders, I promise you nobody liked the leaders who were out there directly persecuting the church. Pray for your leaders. You want, you want a list of what to pray for? How about those five areas? That they wouldn't fall to the temptations of pride and pleasure and power, prosperity. Wouldn't that be, in a sense, reinforcing the bolts? What, what it really does, and I was thinking about this in my own heart, because I, I admit that I don't pray for our leaders as much as I should. What it exposed in my heart was how much I believe prayer actually works. Not, not so much do I believe that, God could, that, that that person could change, but really the question is, do I believe God could change that person? That my prayers would amount to something. That my prayers could essentially reinforce areas of weakness. As I pray for God to work in an area where I know, I know is prone to fail. But it's not just about them that we learn, because I, w- I want us to fast forward to, uh, to what we learn about ourselves, where Israel gets their first king. Right? And so keep in mind, at this point in history, God is working. He's interacting with the nation. He's the king. The prophet is sort of the, the go-between between the king and his people. And, and so Samuel is the, the prophet at this particular time. Samuel's nearing the end of his life. His retirement is in front of him. And he knows that, that they're going to want a king instead of the prophet God is king scenario. And so he's going to the people and knowing they're going to demand the king, and the people demand the king, and, and, and he goes back to God and says, God, what do I do? I know what's going to happen. I know they're going to put somebody here. I know how he's going to fall to power, to pleasure, to pride, to prosperity. I know, God, what do we do here? And this is what we see in First Samuel chapter 8. And it says, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And so Samuel goes on, and you can read this in 1 Samuel 8. He goes on to say, stand before the people and say, You get a king, but I want you to know something. The king will demand your sons to to lead his teams of chariots, to make weapons for wars, to command his armies, to guard his power. He will demand your daughters to work in his palace to serve for his pleasure. He will take of your vineyards. He will take uh, of your herds to enforce his prosperity. Why? Because he's a man riddled with pride. And look at the response as Samuel concludes. He says, when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refuse to listen to Samuel, and here's the telling part, the temptation, the fail point within ourselves. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel reveals the proneness of a king. Prosperity, power, pleasure, pride. But he also unveils the issues within our own hearts. The propensity that we have in this whole situation where the people are prone to an exaggerated trust. The people are prone to an exaggerated trust that this king will take care of all the things that I don't want to have to take care of. That this king will be so great that he'll lead me into a position where I'll never be personally vulnerable. 
They're prone to an exaggerated trust. To think that this person can do what actually only truly God can do. And that exaggerated trust will set them up for failure. It'll set them up for a misplaced hope. It'll set them up for a roller coaster life emotionally as they look and predict whatever is going to happen based on whoever is in charge. He says that they will be prone to this exaggerated trust to, to have a king to go out and fight our battles for us. A king to direct them and guide them in justice. A king to, to go to war for them, which is fascinating to think about because Israel's history, militarily speaking, is incredible. I mean, God has granted them victory after victory as long as they're staying close to Him and trusting on Him and relying on Him. You cannot argue that this is just miracle stuff over and over and over again. And they go, we want a king to do this for us. And Samuel's like, but if you get a king to do this for you, then he's going to have to do it with your sons. And he's going to take your daughters and he's going to take your stuff and he's going to have fail points. Because... This whole system is imperfect at this point. And again, I want to step back and say, it's not that we don't need this system. I got a great quote with C.S. Lewis. We'll get to it in a little bit. I'm just at this point saying, bridge inspectors, step back and see where this can fall. To understand just how much we put hope into something. To understand with a sobriety of what this whole system is. Fall more in love with Jesus Christ in the end. Because what God is ultimately showing us here is that we want, someone to be what only he can be we want somebody to satisfy our fears to solve our problems in only a way that he can fully do and there's a part of us that wants that and samuel looks at the people and they're going give us a king and he goes do you know what it'll cost you and they say i don't care give us a king and you know at the end i read this part specifically samuel says just go home you know why samuel just says go home go back to your town because he's just frustrated. Because he sees how this is going to unfold. In fact, if you compare his speech here to other speeches of other prophets, it's eerily similar to when people have put idols over them. And the words and the phrases that he speaks are very much alluding to the times when Israel has put false gods above the real God. And there's a statement in there when they say, we want to be just like the other nations and have a king. And Samuel knows, you'll be just like the other nations. You'll have a king. In fact, you'll be so much, so similar to the other nations that nobody's really going to be able to tell you apart at all. That at the end of the day, you'll look just like them because you'll forget and you'll reject God. So, so what, do, what do we do with this all? What do, what do we do? What do we take from this? I have two challenges. And the first one is this. Is we have to manage, manage both our heads and our hope well manage both our heads and our hope well. I, I think, I, I, I don't say one is more important than the other right now. J just manage them both well. And so let's start with the idea of what does it mean to, to manage our heads well. First of all, I, I, I admit before you that I'm typically politically passive. I'd rather not have a political conversation. I read a fascinating article this past week by J.I. Packer, and he challenged really three degrees of political um, standpoints in Christianity. One is the super aggressive, one is the very fearful, and the other is the very passive. I find myself in the very passive, so I'm going to speak to that one particularly this morning. My, my debate, or my, my reasoning for that is basically I feel like God has called me to focus on the application of the Word of God through teaching and through living it out, having a church that, that does this. And then, then I read this article by J.I. Packer, and he says this, which I think is very very challenging for me to say, Matt, your head should be in this game. You should understand it. You should not be, you should not be ignorant of it. And he says this, he says, uh, all should, be, all should keep, informed, keep informed. Otherwise, we cannot judge well about issues, vote well for candidates, or pray well for rulers. Political ignorance is never a Christian virtue. Then honestly, it was a time for me to confess and say, God, I, I, honestly, the whole thing is just so chaotic, it's easier for me to not look at. But there's a part of me that's called, as somebody who cares about the good of our society for Jesus Christ, that people would, generally speaking, be loved and be cared for, that I should be informed. There's a part of me locally that should care about the community that we're called to minister to. And if there's political changes that can happen there for the good of that community, I should care about it. 
There's a part of me that should be informed. I would say so much so that I actually had a political conversation this past week for like the first time ever. And, and I had it because I, I was challenged in this area to say I should be a person who's educated by this. I should be. And, and one of the things I want to say, and, and we, we might talk about it a little bit more next week, is, is look, we should talk about this stuff. But by all means, we should be known as people who are spiritual, not opinionated. We can have our opinions, but let's let people know the Spirit of God is within us by the way we act. And so by that I mean the Galatians passage, the fruit for the Spirit in Galatians 5. It would be people of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control. Let's talk politics, but by all means, let's be spiritual as we do it. Let's be people of self-control and love, that we love the person more than the point we're trying to make. So I think we manage our heads, but we also manage our hope. We understand that within this system, I have an opportunity. I have, I have a propensity to want to trust them to fight my battles. And that is God's role entirely. See, hope is this thing where we, we have this, what, what we long for. And we fear it's either going to be denied or it's going to be fulfilled. And speaking about human governments, what we tend to do is attach our, attach our primary hope to based on whether or not we think this system is going to give us what we want or keep us from what we want. It's going to give us what we want or it's going to keep us from what we hope. And please, by all means, for us as followers of Jesus Christ, our hope must be tied to him. Not the outcome of election, of a decision, of, of anything else. Our truest hope must be tied to Jesus Christ or we will forever live a roller coaster of our life. I'll sum it up this way. If you only get one thing, this, this would be what I want you to take home. The preservation of Christianity is not a political process, it's a providential process. The preservation of Christianity is not a political process, it's a providential process. It rests in His hands. If you don't believe me right now, look at what the church is doing in China, where the government system is entirely against any force any form of Christianity, but it's predicted if trends continue by the year 2050, China would be a primarily Christian nation. More higher percentage of Christians than the country of America is. They're not getting any favors from their government. But there is a God who is seeing them through what they're experiencing. Preservation of Christianity is not a political process. It's providential. I mean, it, providential means it rests in His hands. It's in his control. So we manage both our heads and our hope, and your hope is so incredibly precious. Tie it to Jesus Christ. If you want to do that, the second challenge is this, is that we would make sure that our soul only campaigns for one. Practically speaking, you can campaign for people. I don't care, but your soul. Make sure your soul only gets behind one. Make sure your deepest desires, your deepest satisfactions, your ultimate love, make sure it only gets behind one. Jesus Christ. As Timothy was told by Paul, there is only one King of Kings. There is only one ruler of rulers. There is only one Lord of Lords. That's the one that our soul has to get behind. That's the one that our hope has to be married to. It's Him. It's Him. We have a process. We have a government. We respect it. We look at what Christ has called us to do as to be as citizens in that. But at the end of the day, our souls can only campaign for Jesus Christ. I love, love, love the way that C.S. Lewis says this. He says, I am absolutely in favor of democracy. Absolutely. Because we are all sinners. Because we're all sinners, we need checks and balances. And he goes on to say this, democracy is medicine, it's not food. It's medicine for what ails us, but it's not food. Ultimate reality is not democracy because you were made to be ruled. And if you don't acknowledge Jesus as king, you will serve somebody. You will bow the knee to somebody. And you'll either bow the knee to your parents, bow the knee to your spouse, bow the knee to a boss, bow the knee to a society or a ruler, even the person who says, I don't bow the knee to anybody. No way, I refuse to bow my knee to anybody. They will bow their knee to the very idea of not bowing the knee to anybody. Watch them, and they'll live within a set of rules that they're afraid to break because we were made to be ruled. And you will bow to serve somebody. 
C.S. Lewis comes along and says, let it be Jesus Christ. Let him be the one that you campaign for. There's a beautiful story in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus is, is teaching in a small house and it's so crowded that a group of friends try to bring their paralyzed friend to, to, to Jesus and so they can't get in the front door so they literally rip holes through the roof and drop the man through and, and Jesus looks at this man in front of all these religious teachers trying to catch him up and co- trying to get him to stumble in his teaching and Jesus looks at this man and he, he, says, he says, you are forgiven of your sins, have joy. The religious leaders start to mutter amongst themselves and think evil thoughts and, and Jesus says, I know what you're thinking. It's easy to say to a man, your sins are forgiven, but to say, get up and walk is entirely different. And Jesus looks at him and he says, get up and walk, take your mat and go home. The man, for the first time, takes up his mat and walks out the door, having been forgiven of his sins and healed. That's who I bow knee to, that God. No president, no ruler, no king will ever be able to do that. None. Jesus Christ reserves that. Your heart cries out for a ruler. Your heart searches for a ruler. It searches for a king. You'll never find any like Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we love you and we praise you. And in a time of chaos, there is nothing chaotic going on in your throne room right now. In times of uncertainty, there is nothing but joy and peace with you in heaven. Father, I ask that that peace would go from there to our heart where we understand with great wisdom what this system can do and what this system can't do. And because we know its limitations, we redirect our hope and we we establish it firmly in you and your son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his holy and precious name. Amen.